Magnets! How do they work? A great question. While a lot of people resign to believing that magnets are mystical, magical objects that work because science, or something like that, we're going to try our best to analyze them a little bit more scientifically and figure out what they actually do. Before we can get into that nitty-gritty detail, we're going to first have to understand something about electricity and how it compares to magnetism. So, in electricity, we've learned so far that objects can either have a positive charge or a negative charge. In truth, there's also a third option where you can have a neutral charge, like the subatomic particle, the neutron, although neutrons don't really participate in electricity because they don't have charge, so we're going to ignore that for right now. But in electricity, you either have positive or negative charge. You don't have both, you don't have half one and half the other, it's really a binary option. That is not the case for magnetism. In magnetism, objects always have both a north pole and a south pole. This is similar to the fact that there are opposites in electricity, where positives are attracted to negatives and they repel themselves while being attracted to its opposite. Same thing here for magnetism, and you'd know that if you'd played with magnets before, because north sticks to south and south sticks to north. You've seen this exemplified in class as well. But in magnetism, you don't have one or the other, you always have both. If you were to cut this bar magnet in half, you'd actually get two magnets, each with a north and south pole. This is sort of like how everything has a front side and a back side. Even if you cut something in half, it still has a front and a back. You can't have an object with just a front and no back, or just a back and no front. They always exist together. That's how you can think of North Poles and South Poles. Now, electricity is fundamentally different from magnetism in this way, but that doesn't mean they're not related to each other. In fact, they're very closely related to each other in a way we're going to get into very shortly. But first, what is the difference, the actual difference between a magnet and something that isn't a magnet? This is going to be an important question to answer if we want to understand what a magnet actually is and what it does. So let's look at a non-magnet first. If you were to take something like your arm or a pencil or a duck or anything that isn't a magnet and look very closely at its individual particles, so the molecules, the atoms, even maybe something closer than that, you'd see that most everyday objects are made up of, well, really everything is made up of atoms that have a north and south pole. I almost want to say that they're charged north and south because that's terminology you might understand pretty well right now, but even that is inaccurate because charge is a word that applies to electricity only. In magnetism, we would say that things have poles, a north pole and a south pole. North is opposite from south, north attracts south, and south attracts north, and they repel themselves. But in a non-magnet, these individual molecules that each have a north and south are all jumbled up. They're not pointing in any particular direction, in fact, they're pretty much just a big scramble of poles. There's no order to this system. If we look very closely, however, at the individual molecules in a magnet, we'd see that those particles are neatly arranged. And this is actually the only difference between something that is a magnet and something that is not a magnet. A permanent magnet will have north and south poles in an orderly system. So all the norths are pointing in the same direction, all the souths are pointing in the same direction, and because south and north attract one another, this is a very stable setup for the object to have on the molecular level. So it's interesting to think if you could rearrange all of the particles in your body so that all the norths and souths were facing in the same direction all the time, you could actually be a magnet yourself. So, now that we know what a magnet is, let's talk about magnetic fields. But first, we're going to compare it to what we already know. So, we've talked about electric fields before, and you know that an electric field is just an area where charged particles can affect things. It's a place where stuff happens. So, in this picture is a visualization that you've probably seen before. There's a positively charged particle sitting next to a negatively charged particle, and they're interacting in some way. But what's up with all those arrows and lines in the picture? Well, those are called field lines, and the field lines point in a particular direction. All of the field lines that you see in diagrams like this will always point away from positive charges and toward negative charges. Now, why is this? Well, field lines always point in the direction that a positive charge would travel if it was located somewhere in this field. So if there was a proton, let's say, just hanging out right in between the plus and the minus, then it would go toward the minus and away from the plus. And that's a pretty simple journey if you're squat in the middle, but if you're somewhere further out, those field lines will help predict where you'll end up if you are a positive charge. So in other words, the field lines in an electric field tell you what a positively charged particle would do if it was in that area. So that's an electric field, and we've seen examples of this before. What we haven't seen is what we're going to talk about now, which is a magnetic field. 
Now again, electricity and magnetism are eerily similar to each other for a reason that we'll get into in just a little bit. But for now, let's just look at the similarity between these two images. On top, we have a positive and negative creating an electric field. Below, we have a north and a south pole creating a magnetic field, and the diagrams are very similar. In a magnetic field, we still have field lines, these lines that show where things will go in a field that's been created by a magnet. But in this case, the field lines point away from north poles and toward south poles. And anytime you see a diagram of a magnetic field, you'll see it pointing in that direction every time, away from north and towards south. So what do you think that means? Well, if up above an electric field showed what a positively charged particle would do, then it looks like if north repels north and south attracts north, then these field lines must be suggesting what a north pole would do. Now this may seem kind of odd to suggest that the field lines show what a north pole would do, because if you remember what we just discussed a few minutes ago, you know that north and south always exist together in magnetism. You can't actually have a north all by itself just sitting out there. Anytime there's a north, there's a south, guaranteed. But if hypothetically you could, not that you can, but if you could get a north pole all by itself, then these field lines show you what that north pole would want to do if it was in this region. It would want to retreat away from the north, since it would be repelled, and it would want to be attracted and move toward the south pole. So electric fields and magnetic fields, they work pretty much the same way, but they're different forces. Or are they? More on that later. Now one interesting thing you could do in the presence of a magnetic field is you can lay a bunch of compasses around and you'll actually see the needles on the compasses, or come by, is that a word? I don't know. Ask an English teacher. But anyways, these compasses, they would all point their arrows in the direction of these field lines, and we'll try this out in class. That's because the needles on a compass are magnetizable. They aren't permanent magnets themselves, but they can become magnetized very easily. Now speaking of compi, or compasses, Let's remember what a compass is used for. It's used to navigate around the planet Earth, because the Earth has a magnetic field and the needle points towards the top of that magnetic field, which we assume is north. And of course, for that reason, we call it the North Pole. That's where Santa lives. So, of course, if you hold a compass in your hand while you're in the eastern United States, it'll point towards the North Pole. And if you're in California, it'll point towards the North Pole. And if you're in Africa, it'll point towards the North Pole. And if you're in Brazil, it'll go towards the North Pole. Or will it? Here's an interesting thought. If the north pole of your compass is pointing towards the top of the planet, and if north poles seek out south poles, what does that imply about the top of the planet? It implies, accurately might I add, that the Earth's north pole is actually the Earth's magnetic south pole. That's right. The north pole of our planet was actually named as such because the northern ends of the compasses that people had back in the day pointed in that direction. So we said, ah, the north end of our compass points that way, we'll call that way north. Little did we know that in magnetism, north actually seeks out south. So geographically, we call our top of the planet the North Pole, but in actuality, it is our magnetic south pole. Believe it or not, the poles of our planet actually switch from time to time, and eventually the North Pole will actually be a magnetic north pole. A lot of people think that that's an apocalyptic scenario, and I can assure you it is not, although it may mess with a few GPS systems, but we've got nothing to worry about. Okay, now that's about all you need to know about magnets in general, but I have been referencing a few times the fact that electricity is tightly linked to magnetism. Now why is that? Well, it turns out, and this is going to be the big reveal, that there's actually something called electromagnetism. And maybe you've heard me use that word in the past, and that's because this is the more accurate term rather than referring to electricity or magnetism as two separate entities. Really, they're both one and the same. Electromagnetism is the idea that electricity creates magnetism. You could say it the other way as well. You could say magnetism creates electricity. Now, what do I mean by electricity creates magnetism? Well, more specifically, I mean that a moving electron creates a magnetic field around it. So, let's show an example of that. Here's a wire. This is going to be a wire that can carry electrons through it. So here's our electron. As the electron flows, we'd say that there's an electric current, or I, flowing through the wire. Now, if you want to see where the magnetism comes into play here, you're going to need to do a little bit of audience participation. So we're going to try something called the right hand rule. Now, I'm going to ask you to use your right hand in real life to do something that's going to help you analyze the magnetism that results from this electricity. All you need to do is the following. Take your right hand and extend it toward your screen. Don't break it. Don't break the screen. 
you need to take your hand and imagine that you're wrapping it around a wire like the one shown in the diagram. Okay, is your hand imaginarily wrapped around this wire? Good. Now make sure that your thumb is pointed in the direction of the electron's travel. In other words, your thumb should be in the direction of current flow. Okay, so is your thumb pointed in the direction of current? Yes, good. Are your other fingers wrapped around the wire? Yes, okay. Now notice that all four of your fingers, apart from your thumb, are wrapped in the same direction. Now, of course, that's due to the mechanism of your fingers and how your hand is set up, but it's very useful for identifying where the magnetic field is going to be pointing in this wire. Now, if you look at your four fingers, they're curled in the direction of the magnetic field that would be generated from that motion of the electron. So this may seem kind of odd because the electron is moving linearly in a straight line path, whereas the magnetic field it creates is kind of swirling around in a circular pattern. And it's true, that's strange, but that's how it works. A moving electron creates a magnetic field in that circular pattern. So what does this mean? It means if you had a north pole, not that you could have a north pole on its own in reality, but if hypothetically a north pole went near that wire, it would be pushed in the direction of those blue arrows. So with this current carrying wire, you can now generate magnetic forces. Let's say you want to make some more forces. Well, how about you put twice the amount of electrons moving through a similar wire? What would that do if you had a stronger current, more specifically if you had twice the current flow? Well, as you might expect, twice the current flow means twice the strength of your magnetic field generated. So if you want to generate very large magnetic forces, all you've got to do is put a huge amount of current through your wires. We don't necessarily want to do that in the lab because large current means large danger. So, rather than making strong magnetic forces with large currents, instead we'll just take a low current and we'll apply it over and over and over again by looping our wires. So now I'm going to have you imagine that wire from the previous example looped into a circle. The electron will now travel in a circular pattern and it'll create its own magnetic field based on its travel. So we're going to use that right hand rule again here. I'm going to ask you to take your right hand and again, do not break your computer but put your hand towards the screen and I want you to imagine yourself wrapping your hand, your right hand that is, around the wire where the electron is located in this diagram. So on the left hand side of that loop, imagine you're grabbing your right hand around it with your thumb pointed in the direction of current flow. So that would mean pointed up in this case. Now if you're doing that right now, you can look at your fingers and see that they're curled in this direction. That would be counterclockwise unless you're standing on your head right now, which I hope you're not, because that's going to make everything very confusing here. Okay, next, I'm going to ask you to take your hand and put it on the top of the wire. So I'll give you a second for that. Take your right hand and imagine yourself wrapping it around the top of that loop, and you should notice that your fingers are in this coiled position, where they're moving in front of the wire, and then behind it, and in front of it, and then behind it. Okay, so now you've got that one. And let's now put it on the right-hand side of the loop, give you a second for that. This one might take you a second to figure out. Go ahead, you're taking your right hand and you're wrapping it around the wire with your thumb pointed down because that's now the direction of current flow. Okay, have you got it? Good. Should look like this with your four fingers coiled in a clockwise direction. Now finally we'll put our right hand on the bottom of the wire. This one should be a little easier than the last one and your thumb should be pointed to the left, and now your four coiled fingers should be in this orientation, where they're going in front and then behind, in front and then behind, in this orientation. Okay, so go ahead and put your right hand down, give it a little rest. Now notice the pattern that's unfolded here. In the center of our looped wire, our current carrying wire, all of the magnetic fields are being pushed into the center. Our magnetic field, in other words, is entering the page. So we've got to think in three dimensions here, even though we're looking at a flat picture. So the magnetic field is entering the page on the inside, but if you look around the loop, in those regions, we see the magnetic field exiting the page. So we're seeing things going in in the center and out on the outside. Now it may be kind of hard to visualize what's happening here, so let's look at this in a different perspective. Here's the same example with some new coloration. We've got our current carrying wire that's moving around and around and around, and the result is that a magnetic field is generated that pushes north poles in the direction being shown by those green arrows. Now again, you can't actually have a north pole all by itself, but if you could, these magnetic field lines show you where that north pole would go. And if you have something magnetizable, like let's say a paper clip or an iron nail, then that would be thrust through the loop. Now there's a name for this, and this is typically called an electromagnet, because you're creating a magnetic field using electricity. 
But this electromagnet is going to be pretty weak if there's only one coil. So if you wrap around that wire multiple times, and this example is showing that coil turned on its side and wrapped about 10 times, you get a stronger magnetic field as a result because you're layering all of those coils on top of one another, adding their strength together. So the red arrows in this case are showing the direction of current flow, and if you wanted to, you could take your right hand and wrap them around, in your imagination of course, each of those white wires in any location, and your four coiled fingers would always be pointing in the direction that those blue arrows are showing. So there's a magnetic field that pushes through that long coil. This is the theory behind an electromagnet, something that uses electricity to create a magnetic field. And you've actually seen several examples of these in popular culture, believe it or not. The most recent example being Iron Man, who in the Marvel Cinematic Universe has a piece of metal shrapnel that's trying to make its way to his heart, killing him. So as any good scientist would, he builds an electromagnet, something that runs on electricity and creates magnetism, that pulls on that piece of metal, preventing it from reaching his internal organs. Now, hopefully in class, we're not going to be shooting shrapnel into anybody's body cavities, but if we do, we can always just build an electromagnet, and hopefully that'll solve all of our problems. Maybe. So, just in the event that such an event occurs, we're going to be building electromagnets in class, but what we'll likely do to make them even stronger, you know, in case of emergency, is to add something in the center that is magnetizable. Because if you can get something that's magnetizable, like a steel nail or an iron core, like the one that's shown on the right in this diagram, as opposed to the left, where there's just air in the middle, you can actually make your field a lot stronger. And that's because the iron core on the right is magnetizable, which means all the north and south poles get rearranged as soon as you put them in the magnetic field that you've created, and all the north's pointing in one direction and all the south's pointing in the other direction makes for a stronger field. So to summarize, when you've got an electromagnet, put something magnetizable on the inside and you've got a stronger electromagnet. Finally, I just want to show you guys a couple clips of electromagnets being used in the real world in ways you may not have realized before, but you've probably seen.